Hello, my name is Daniel Burgess. This is the third installment on a series I'm working on about the stars uh, and its relationship to Genesis and its relationship to what Jesus said to Nicodemus about even as Moses lifted the serpent on the pole in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up for God so loved the world. He gave his only begotten Son. That's how it reads. Um, so the likeness of what happened in the Exodus with Moses is the likeness of Jesus Christ's atonement for us. Uh, but there's a lot of information we left off talking about uh, the celestial sphere and the original constellations uh, expressing... Uh, the Word of God in one form or another. And uh, I wanted to cite some authorities on this subject. Uh, but uh, I'm going to read briefly from The Astronomy of the Bible by E. Walter Maunder. Uh, great book. Really worth the read. Um, and in his book... Uh, I'm not sure what the deal is, but uh, it's called Chapter 2. It's not exactly the real Chapter 2. Uh, I think this is a combination of a couple of old books. Anyways, but Chapter 2, page 162, uh, titled Genesis and the Constellations. He says, as we have just shown, the constellations evidently were designed long before the earliest books of the Old Testament received their present form. But the first nine chapters of Genesis give the history of the world before any date that we can assign to the constellations and are clearly derived from very early documents or traditions. When the constellations are compared with those nine chapters, several correspondences appear between the two. Remarkable when it is borne in mind how few events that can be plainly set forth in a group of 48 figures on the one hand, and how condensed are the narratives of those nine chapters on the other. So he's, uh, he's presenting a counter-argument for what he uh, believes. Um, he says it's uh, remarkable that so few events in the first nine chapters of Genesis... Um, Uh, are plainly set forth in a group of 48 constellations uh, compared to how condensed there's so much information in those nine chapters uh, that it's easy to discount this is what he's saying. Uh, which he uh, is arguing against. He's saying it's not worth discounting. Um, and he goes on to describe... Uh, the uh, six southern constellations uh, that describe the constellation of Noah, or uh, the story of Noah, the ark landing on the mountain, the man coming off the ark offering sacrifice on the altar, and the smoke of the altar here is the Milky Way. And here's Sagittarius hanging his bow in the cloud as a covenant between him and man, which is why I believe they're both cent depicted as centaurs uh, because the blood covenant between the two, sacrificial covenant, uh, would make them flesh of their flesh and bone of their bone. So that makes perfect sense to me. But uh, So he's referring to these constellations here. Um, and then he also refers to... Uh, Another five constellations um, close by this group was another made up of five constellations. Uh, towards the south, near midnight in the spring, the observer in those ancient times would see the scorpion. Uh, which uh, basically... Here's the scorpion trying to lay hold on judgment or the truth, which is the word of God, which is the seed of the woman. Here's Leo. Um, 
and here's Virgo, and she's holding the seed, or it's a really bright star, and she's over the Leviathan that's stretched across the heavens. Um, but her seed is the truth, which is taken hold of by the scorpion, but he overcomes the scorpion uh, with his foot. This is Ophicus, and he's holding uh, the serpent that he's wrestling, and head to head, sometimes they actually share a head, uh, is Hercules, whose foot is on the head of the dragon. So all of this, which is uh, depicting the... Uh, He says that that marked the autumnal equinox in this day and time. Um, but anyways, he's saying that, that that's astonishing, you know, that you can have all of this depicting Christ. Uh, or depicting uh, things from Genesis, which you have uh, the first prophecy of Christ being that he put his head on the, put his foot on the head of the dragon and the dragon bruised his heel or the serpent whatever, um, the Nakash, um, but, uh, so the victory of the seed of the woman, uh, is expressed uh, by the constellation Aquila. <clears throat> and Aquila was kind of interesting. Um, let's see here. Got all my books ready. Um, but he says, uh, Richard Hinckley Allen, in his book, Star Names, uh, Their Lore and Meaning, um, page 56 in his article on Aquila, he says that... Uh, the our constellation is supposed to be represented by the bird figured on the Euphratean uranographic stone of about 1200 BC uh, and known on the tablets as Iduzama, uh the eagle, the living eye. Uh, I thought the term the living eye was very interesting uh, because it's associated uh, uh, with the biblical concept about the eyes of the Lord, the living eye, uh, which we're going to get into uh, here in a minute. But uh, he goes on to say the Hebrews knew it, referring to Aquila the bird, as Nashir, an eagle, falcon, or vulture, and the Chaldee par paraphrase, which is an old uh, manuscript, asserted that it was figured on the banners of Dan. But these tribal symbols properly were for the zodiac. Uh, I wish he cited his source. I really do. Uh, Scorpio usually was ascribed to Dan. This confusion may have originated from the fact asserted by Sir William Drummond uh, that in Abraham's day, Scorpio was figured as an eagle. I wasn't able to verify that. Um, I'm sure I can if I spend a little more time on it. It takes a long time to verify a lot of this stuff. Uh, but Bonder just presents it like Aquila is close enough to the serpent and the scorpion for it to not matter. He said that those could be a family of signs. Uh, and so any one of these three could have uh, depicted the ensign of Dan, which nobody actually knows what they look like. Uh, you know, there is an old agreement on... Uh, the four gates and what their four ensigns were, which is why, you know, Hinckley Allen refers to, uh, refers to it, you know, Scorpio usually being ascribed to Dan. Uh, either way, I'm fine. Um, uh, 
either interpretation that you're not going to really be able to verify a whole lot. Um, <clears throat> but but Maunder goes on to say in closing of these two chapters, he says, uh, more than one third of the constellation figures thus appear to have a close connection with some of the chief incidents recorded in the first ten chapters of Genesis as having taken place in the earliest ages of the world's history. If we include the hare and the two dogs uh, as adjuncts of Orion and the cup as well as the raven with Hydra, then no fewer than 22 out of 48 constellations are directly or indirectly so connected. But the constellation figures only deal with a very few isolated incidents. And these are necessarily such as lend themselves to graphic representation. The points in common with Genesis' narrative are indeed striking, but the points of independence are no less striking. The majority of the constellation figures do not appear to refer to any incidents in Genesis. The majority of the incidents in Genesis' narrative find no record in the sky. Even in the treatment of incidents common to both, there are differences which make it impossible to suppose that either was directly derived from the other. But it is clear that when constellations were devised, that is to say, roughly speaking, about 2700 BC, the promise of the deliverer, the seed of the woman who should bruise the serpent's head, was well known and highly valued, so highly valued that a large part of the sky was devoted to its commemoration and to that of the curse on the serpent. The story of the flood was also known. Uh, he was referring to Draco, whose head is being stepped on by Hercules, uh, who underneath Hercules has a mirrored sign of Ophicus, who's wrestling the serpent and conquering the scorpion. Um, that's uh, the so highly valued large part of the sky that was devoted to its com commemoration to that curse on the serpent. The story of the flood was also known, and especially the covenant made with those who were saved in the ark, uh, that the world should not again be destroyed by water, the token of which covenant was the bow set in the cloud the fourfold cherubic forms were known as the keepers of the way of the tree of life and symbols of the presence of god and they were set for uh in the four parts of heaven marking it out as the tabernacle which he spreadeth abroad for he dwelleth between the cherubim um And that's what we're discussing, uh, the tree of life being symbolized by the celestial sphere. So when he says the fourfold cherubic forms were known uh, as the keepers of the way of the tree of life and the symbols of the presence of God, uh, you know, he establishes in his book that the cherubims represent the solstices and the equinoxes. Um, and that the four main gates of the encampment of the Exodus were definitely represented by these four positions of uh, the zodiac or the sun marking the solstices and the equinox to be more specific um <clears throat> concerning associating the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil with the celestial sphere uh one of my favorite writers uh she doesn't know how much knowledge she preserved uh but she she sure did but uh, her name was Zalia Natal, and uh, as you can see, the, the name of this book is a mouthful, so let me look at it. The Fundamental Principles of Old and New World Civilizations, a comparative research based on a study of the ancient Mexican religious, sociological, and calendrical systems. Um, incredible book. I love this lady. Uh, she says uh, on page 364... Um, she's discussing Asiatic civilizations, which, uh, anyways, um, <clears throat> the adoption of the shaft or pole 
as a symbol of the celestial center may easily be explained by the fact that stuck into the ground and watched from a certain position, its upper end would seem to touch Polaris. In their day and time, it would have been Serpens, the, the former pole star in the tail of the constellation Draco. Uh, but uh, it would seem to touch the pole star and thus supplied the wandering star observer with a point of fixity in space which being transportable facilitated the registration of circumpolar rotation. Uh, when you line something up with the pole star, every other star in the sky will move in a perfect circle around the pole star. And uh, I'll show you uh, what I'm referring to with the diagram from the History and Practice of Ancient Astronomy by James Evans. Uh, like I said, one of my favorite books of all time. Uh, but here's a depiction of the pole star, and every star in the sky will move in a perfect circle around that star. Uh, which uh, he even shows what we're talking about. Uh, you know how to measure the distance between Polaris and the Earth, uh, or how to find exact north, which Polaris isn't perfectly north, but, you know, you're going to be heading north. It actually spins a little bit, because we're moving away from uh, the Earth's axis pointing at that star perfectly. It's not happening anymore. Uh, but to uh, further describe what uh, Miss Natal is saying, say, uh, this is my walking staff here. And uh, this is the North Star, you know, you just line it up with the top of it. And you can have notches, you know, marking uh, uh, the elevation of the star uh, tells you how far north or south you are, you know. So you can have notches that measure out how far uh, high up the star should be from the horizon, uh, telling you where, how far you are north or south. Um, you know, and you might see old walking staffs that had a circle uh, put into it, and then, you know, it kept going up past the hole. But, uh, you know, and that circle could have notches uh, marking where other stars should be, uh, letting them know where east and west is at a certain time of the night, a certain time of the year. All of that would have to be kept in mind. Uh, and I believe that they, you could probably find some old staffs with these type of descriptions on them, whether people could figure out that that's what it was or not is another story. But nonetheless, that's uh, basically an old way of navigating uh, if you were traveling between cities. Um, During many centuries, the image of the crooked serpent Nakash, the constellation Draco, uh, which could be seen each night winding its way around the pole, must have deeply impressed itself upon the minds of the primitive stargazers of the Euphratian Valley and conveyed suggestions of Im imagery of which may have created the Phoenician caduceus at a... This is Natal speculating. Um, at a later period when Ursa Major became circumpolar, the seven lights of heaven became in turn associated with the stable center and suggested in time the seven branch candlesticks of the Hebrews, which is to this day constructed with a central or principal holder associated with stability. Um, these, uh, this brings up something very interesting uh, that I want to try to get through. But uh, concerning the eyes of the Lord. Uh, Man, this is a, a you know, this is a whole concept or idea from the Bible. So but uh but the eyes of the Lord is an ideology from from the scripture and uh it's really exactly what's being taught by the serpent on the pole in Jesus' reference uh to Nicodemus. But uh Zechariah 4 verse 10 Where we're headed. Um, which says, for 
verse 9 says, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. Uh, Zerubbabel uh, was the high priest who was uh, coming back from Persia to rebuild the temple. This was the guy who was going to rebuild the temple. And Zechariah is prophesying that that's what's going to happen. Um, For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. And I answered and said unto him, What are these two olive trees upon the right side of the candlestick and upon the left side thereof? And I answered again and said unto him, What be these first two olive branches which uh, through the golden pipes empty the golden oil out of themselves? And he answered and said, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said, These be the two anointed ones that stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Um, which are the priest and the king that... So you're going to get into a whole nother thing, studying the priest and the king, uh, which is Melchizedek. Uh, which is funny, because it ties off, it ti actually ties in to uh, where we're headed concerning the Tower of Babel. It's kind of funny. But uh, in Zechariah 2, verse 8, it says that... Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. Uh, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, After the glory hath sent, he hath, he sent me unto the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you, Israel, toucheth the apple of his eye. And that word apple is the word baba, which means pupil. You're going to touch the pupil of God's eye when you hurt his church, is what we're going to get at here. Um... And uh, I'll go ahead and read this. Uh, chapter 3, 8 through 10 says, Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, which uh, that is Jesus' name, Joshua, Jehovah saves. Uh, which is very interesting. But uh, hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch, capital B R A N C H. Um, for behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes, which means perfect wisdom. Uh, eyes is usually a reference to wisdom or a type of knowledge. Uh, behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. And in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. You'll call every man neighbor, which Jesus taught a whole parable about who a neighbor was. Uh, which uh, the Jews, you know, avoided the person who was bleeding to death on the street instead of helping him, you know. But the good Samaritan helped the man, and the, the Jews despised, utterly hated Samaritans. Uh, they would uh, walk around the whole town of Samaria, uh, which was a lot of extra walking. I don't remember how much. But uh, just to avoid Samaritans. So Jesus was really setting them up when he told that. Uh, and as a side note, uh, I can't remember who it was. Uh, Jesus told one of his po apostles, I thought it was... Uh, Thomas, uh, that I, I saw thou sitting under the fig tree, and he, said he knew he was the Messiah. It was always kind of a mysterious verse to me. I think uh, maybe he was reading this verse or dreaming this verse under the fig tree. Uh, but nonetheless, um, 2 Chronicles 16 and 9 refers to the eyes of the Lord. And it says, 
For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show capital H himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. So, and, uh, We've got to read Revelations 1, verse 20. My Bible's falling apart, sorry. <laughs> but uh, this is the revelation, singular, of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants. So, the revelation of Jesus Christ has been given to Jesus Christ to reveal to his servants. Um, and, he, and he sent this uh, and signified it uh, by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the testimony. And that's what this book is. Um, but... He sees the throne of God, and he describes it, um, and he says that in his right hand he, he had seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, which is the word of God, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And I saw him, and I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand, which has seven stars in it, upon me, saying un unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last, I am he that liveth, and he and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and death. Uh, which is really important to know that Jesus says he has the keys of hell and death. Uh, you have to apply it to his own death. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, period. The seven stars, uh, not that there's any punctuations in the Greek text, but uh, the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven golden candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So he's saying that the seven golden candlesticks are the church, uh, the seven churches. And uh, the seven churches that uh, he calls out uh, starting immediately after this, uh, it's the picture of in entering into divine scrutiny beforehand because like, he's, he's making us friends to where we know everything the Lord doeth. So it's a preview for God's scrutiny against you. I love what Job said. And does... Uh, do I enter into judgment with one such as thee? You know, like, oh God, that's scary. And if you really start to hone in on that, it is scary. Um, but, so that's the seven church, the one that believes in God's judgment against them. And they agree with Jesus. Hey, this is sin and it's got to go. And that's what makes you a believer. <laughs> it's the only difference. Like, you, you think sin is bad. That's it. You're still a sinner. You're still just as much a sinner as anybody else. You just agree with God against your sin. Uh, which I believe is ultimately an ideology related to taking advantage of others. But, but, Job 34, 21 refers to the eye of the Lord. Proverbs 15 and 3 says uh, he beholds the evil and the good. And uh, I believe that that was referring to throughout the books of the kings. You'll find, you know, like Asa did good in the eyes of the Lord. And you'll find Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord. And it'll basically tell you whether each king did good or evil in the eyes of the Lord. Um, and uh, ultimately, you know... This is the word of God living in you. That's the eyes, what the doctrine of the eye of the Lord is, is that when you believe God, he lives in you. And 
you have essentially the candlestick is the eye of the Lord. Uh, what she's saying about a central socket, uh, some people believe that the menorah wasn't flat, but it had a central socket, and each one of the arms came off at a different level. But and it actually made the Star of David. Um, from above, if you looked at it from above, it would look like a Star of David. Uh, which, uh, I'll go ahead and do that for you real quick. But if the arms came off at equal lengths, uh, then, uh, it would look like that from above. Uh, and quite possibly the case. Uh, and they, they still could have come out at different levels. You know, like the first one would just be really long and short. The second one would be equally long and longer. And the third one would be equally long and taller. Uh, but and it would make a, a star of David. Uh, and I, I believe that just because the Bible is saying that his believers, which is the people in the Exodus, the church, the body of God, which the body of Christ is a blood ritual concept, um, they were all in the wilderness and camped here, and they were all doing... Uh, whole system of blood ritual which made them all flesh of their flesh and bone of their bone but also united them with the altars uh before the throne of god and then once a year uh i'm doing this backwards but uh once a year uh you know the high priest would go into where god sat and pour blood on this and that was on the day of atonement and that was a consummation of the oneness of israel um uh, which is uh, extremely significant. I, I mean, that's the oneness of the body of Christ. That's where that whole doctrine comes from. Um, which is the doctrine of the eyes of the Lord, having God in you, which is his ideas, his word, his knowledge, his laws, in you, perceiving the world through the eyes of God. That's the whole concept. You know, I'm not looking at the world through the eyes of men where I should be trying to strive amongst men to get advantage and money so I can, you know, be more important than the next guy. It's ridiculous. Uh, goes completely, human advantage is completely in opposition to human equality. Uh, the moment a human takes advantage of another human being, there isn't equality. And it's disgusting. But... The uh, Natal goes on to say that the idea cited by Mr. Robert Brown of the sacred poultry with the golden apples guarded by the constellation Nakash, which is the word serpent in the garden, uh, has already been mentioned, uh, and to this ancient image should be added the celestial tree of life set in the midst of the garden of paradise, whence went out a river of water to the garden, and from thence it parted and became four heads. It's easy to see how the standard of Asher, uh, of a, that was the ancient capital of Assyria, which always marked the central place of worship, should have been evolved as it is to realize why the fire stick, rod, or scepter should have been adopted by monarchs as an emblem of central rulership, and why finally each center of government should have adopted some specific symbol which mounted on the staff became its tribal or national emblem. Um, everybody remembers, you know, the monarch with the staff with the jewel on the top, you know. Uh, that's where that comes from which the candlestick itself would be representing uh, the heavens, or the tree of life. 
Uh, in Revelation 4, it says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. So he's looking up to heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as a word, trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee the things which must be hereafter. So he comes up. And immediately I was <clears throat> in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven. And he that sat on the throne was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in the sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne uh, were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting clothed in white raiment. And they had on their heads grounds of gold. Uh, which you can look at First Chronicles 24 verse 3 or Exodus 28 verse 36. And find uh, the 24 elders. Uh, that, um. You know, but describing Jesus on the throne of heaven, surrounded by the iris, or the rainbow, or the circle of lights. Um, and he has the, the, the uh, cherubim around him, which they're going to describe in a second. Um, but uh, the four and 20, 24 elders is... Uh, Two priests for each sign of the zodiac. Um, you know, so it's 24 elders surrounding a throne. You know, it's describing the heavens, but uh, the 24 elders were also the priesthood. Um, and you can go look at that in the Bible. Uh, and he says, Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, which are the church. Uh, that was the mystery that it is the church. Um, but that's the seven golden candlesticks before the throne. Uh, literal. Uh, he's seeing the real thing in heaven is what's happening. Uh, but here's the seven golden candlesticks before the throne of God. Uh, here's the mer the altar of incense, table of showbread. And uh, on both sides of the mercy seat sat two cherubim, and then two cherubim were woven into uh, this curtain. Uh, and he says, uh, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and there was in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Uh, the sea of glass, sea of brass, it's the brazen sea where you have to be purified. Uh, I'll go ahead and mention this. Uh, Baptism uh, included the notion of heaven being in the water. Uh, because when everyone looks at the water, they either see the clouds of the sky or the stars of the sky. And they thought that that uh, made the properties of heaven intrinsic to the water. So when they poured the water over their head, that was the purity of heaven washing them clean. Uh, but, uh, and he says the first beast was like a lion, the second beast was like a calf, the third beast had the face of a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. Um, <clears throat> and like I said, that those represented the solstices and equinoxes of that. The day and time uh, corresponding with the flood. Uh, according to biblical chronology. Um, and the four beasts, each of them, uh, had six wings about them, and they were full of eyes uh, within, and the, they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is and was and is to come. Um, so the pattern of heaven is here. Uh, the pattern of the tabernacle is here. And uh, both of these literal, literal tabernacle, literal celestial sphere, stars in the sky, are expressing the eternal heaven that I believe John is uh, seeing right here. He's seeing the real McCoy, not the one expressed uh, by the names or the authority of the stars that God had given. That's only expressing his word. Uh, so there has to be a real one. But... Um, 
But Robert Brown, uh, in page 29 of a book he wrote called Primitive Constellations uh, that Zalia Natal is referring to, uh, he says the constellation Dracon is Phoenician or Canaanite in origin and represents primarily Nakash the, or Quad, Quadim, Quadmoon, the old serpent, and, uh, or the nocturnal and chaotic heavens personified in monstrous form, uh, Draconic. Or serpentine. Uh, the name Ferrichide Syros, translated by uh, Giron Ophion, and in his cosmology related how Ophion, otherwise Ophinius, and Eurynome ruled over, ruled at first over the world until they were overthrown by Il or El or Kronos and Ama or Rhea. Uh, this serpentine creature is also necessarily the garden of the stars or the golden apples, which hang from the pole tree in the garden of darkness at night. Uh, and his consort is uh, Erebonema, beautiful night, Erinome. Uh But as the darkness of night is necessarily connected with the departure of the sun, Bab, As, uh, Babylonian, Assyrian, Eribu, sunset, i.e. darkness, the verb eribu meaning to set or descend as the sun, hence the Hebrew eriba meaning evening, or the Greek eribos meaning primarily the gloom after sunset, and secondarily the gloom of the underworld. Europa, i.e. the west or sunset or sunset side of the world, Arab, the dweller west of the Euphrates Valley, Thus, the cave of Skyle is said to front towards the west to Erebos. The garden of darkness becomes therefore a garden in the west, equaling the garden of Hesperides, at which Heracles, as the sun god in his twelve labors, uh, necessarily arrives where he obtains the golden apples, the idolized quinces, uh, from Hen and the wanderings of plants and animals, page 185, or the Cydonian Cretan apple. In this western garden, Ophion is no longer regarded as a monster god, but simply as a monster is called Laudan, uh, or the lizard, or the crawling monster, uh, hence an alligator, and is of course overcome by the sun god. The stars in this portion of the heavens naturally adapt themselves to the form of a serpent, especially when arranged at a period when the two groups of Wayne stars were already recognized. The constellation is alluded to in Job 13 as the crooked serpent, Nakash, and in the sphere of the foot of Heracles is planted the twisting serpent's head in token of victory. Um, but Bullinger... Uh, Concerning apples being associated with uh, the uh, tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this is where that comes from, uh, what Robert Brown is saying here about uh, the celestial tree of life being associated with the golden apples or the constellations. That's where it comes from. Uh, Bullinger, E.W. Bullinger wrote uh, notes for a companion Bible, uh, really good stuff. It's like the only Bible I want to use. I've tried to switch to some other ones, but uh, I like this Bible. But um, really good stuff in here, but it, he's got some notes on the serpent of the garden. Uh, and uh, just to show you how... A, and it's funny, because Bullinger was a proponent for uh, the gospel and the stars, so, you know... Bullinger did a lot of work with his life, and, uh, you know, I give any contradictions to his own interpretations to the fact that he had been busy for so long, and the longer you go, the more your understanding will change, but, uh, the, uh, but he says uh, in Appendix 19 on the Serpent of Genesis 3, uh, in the middle here, he says, It is wa wonderful how a snake could ever be supposed to speak without organs of speech, or that Satan should be supposed to be able to accomplish so great a miracle. It only shows the power of tradition, which has from infancy of each one of us 
put before our eyes and written our, on our minds the picture of a snake and an apple, the former snake being based on the wrong interpretation and the latter being pure invention about which there is not one word said in Holy Scripture. Uh, and he concludes with, uh, this is his object in perpetuating the traditions. This is Satan's object. He, he believes in a magical Satan that's out to get people, which is fine, which is fine. I don't think you can conclude uh, that interpretation. I'm not sure. Uh, you got to really be non-biased and open to what it means. But uh, he says this... Uh, this is Satan's object in perpetuating the traditions of the snake and the apple because it ministers to the acceptance of his lie, the hiding of God's truth, the support of tradition, the jeers of the infidel, the opposition of the critics, and the stumbling of the weak in faith. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's a, some hard words uh, against the idea of a serpent. But... Uh, and the idea of apples, but he's definitely right about apples. It's not contained in the scripture, but you know, it, this is definitely where it comes from associating the celestial sphere with the tree of the knowledge of uh, good and evil, with the serpent winding through the garden, protecting the fruit, so to speak. Um, Robert Brown also wrote another book called. Uh, Semitic influence in Hellenic mythology. <coughs> and uh, in his chapter, uh, The Ario Semitic School of Hellenic Mythology, uh, on page 190, uh, he's referring to a guy named Mr. Ruskin, uh, who's describing the sculptures of the Tower of Giotto at Florence. And uh, Mr. Ruskin says, The next sculpture is of Eve spinning and Adam hewing the ground into clods. Above them, an oak and an apple tree. Into the apple tree, a little bear is trying to climb. The figure of the bear is again represented by Jacopo della Quercia uh, on the north door of uh, the Cathedral of Florence. And I am not sure of its complete meaning. Uh, the bear trying to get the fatal apple is thus connected with Eve, universal mother, the great Ursa Matronalis, uh, referring to Ursa Major. Uh, the animal appears on the coins of the Hadrianothera Manthena. Um, just to show that... Uh, The idea, you know, that he was a proponent of the Garden of Eden being a myth typified by the celestial sphere. Robert Brown, in, back in his book on primitive constellations in uh, chapter 8, uh, on page 314, he says, uh, the chapter is titled Babylonian Astronomy After Alexander. And the overthrow of uh, Dara Yavush, uh, the third presented most unexpectedly a final and marvelous chance of headship and supremacy to the mighty city which had witnessed the far-off glories of Hammurabi and the comparatively recent and almost unparalleled splinters of Nebuchadnezzar uh, the Great. For the wondrous Macedonian Alexander, even at that supreme moment when fate and gloomy night encompassed him around, had decided that Swanaki, the place of heavenly power, known as Tin Tirki, the place of the tree of life, and Ka Daringa uh, Dingira, Ka Dingira, the gate of the gods, which later a the which the latter appellation, the Semite rendered Babylu or Babylon. Uh, sh Alexander decided that that should be the cent center and capital of the worldwide empire um just to show you you know that they considered babylon the place of the tree of life at this point uh, and uh genesis teaches that uh nimrod founded 
Babylon, so to speak. It says, uh, I'll just, let me read it. It says, And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth. Uh, uh, he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Uh, wherefore it was said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, uh, in the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Erek and Akkad and Talna and out of the land of Shinar. Uh, which Shinar means place of the two rivers, if I recall. Make sure I'm telling you right. 